Let us pray. Uh, we thank you, God, for the ability to join together from all over the place. Help us to open our hearts to hear um, what it means to love you from everywhere in the world. Bless this time together that we uh, may set aside uh, what we believe always to be true in order to hear what may be a deeper truth. Uh, we pray for each and every one for enough sleep and rest and ability to stay attentive. All in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Elder Troy. I will share an introduction of our lecturer uh, today, and then we, we want to get right to uh, Reverend Dr. Anna's content. So uh, permit me to provide an introduction here today. Reverend Dr. Anna Esther is an ordained clergy of the Metropolitan Community Church of Belo Horizonte, Brazil. She is a feminist, lesbian, queer theologian and holds a PhD and Master in Religious Studies from the Pontifical Catholic University of Minas Gerais, Brazil. She is the current representative for Latin America and the board co-chair for G-I-N-S-S-O-G-I-E. Anna Esther is also a member of the American Academy of Religion and the Brazilian Association of Trans Homo Culture Studies. Uh, Reverend Dr. Anna is a recognized speaker in Brazil on queer theologies, having presented talks within LGBTQIA plus faith communities, including Christians, uh, as well as Buddhists and Jews. We are so excited, Professor, uh, Reverend Dr. Anna Esther, we welcome you and we look forward to hearing from you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, greetings, everyone. It's so good to see so many faces that I, I know, so feel more welcome. Um, uh, Tommy is here today. She's going to help me, right? I can't see. Yeah. I have prepared some slides to help you to understand my, my accent because I speak Portuguese. I do not speak Spanish. I'm from Brazil, so I speak uh, Portuguese. And my accent is kind of hard to understand. If we don't understand something, Nancy is here. Praise the Lord so she can help me. And um, I would like to thank the, the Council of, of Elders for this, um, uh, for this invitation. I feel blessed and honored. Yesterday, I called Nancy and I said, why did I say yes to this? <laughs> because I have such a hard time with English. And so please, uh, uh, I- You are good. <laughs> I thank you guys for uh thank you all for all the the understanding um and also because uh now listening to uh, Elder Velma saying she wants to get practical things I kind of gonna disappoint you <laughs> because I had prepared um a presentation really focused on uh theoretical stuff because I, I saw that what my name was the first. So I, I wanted to give a framework of what we are considering calling um, margin. What are we understanding by margin and center? So thank you for the kind invitation. And uh, my proposal for today is to present a theoretical framework to, for thinking about the margin from the theology of Marcel Altausrit. The presentation will be very theoretical, but I believe that in the second half of our meeting, based on your questions, I'll be able to present concrete cases of marginal theology from my experience as a, a clergy in Brazil. So the, the theme I'm proposing for today is marginal desire and unsubmissive transit between the center and the margin of Christianity. Uh, next, please. The quote that is going to lead my talk is God is Desire, which is in uh, the book Indecent Theology, um, written by Marcel Altausrid. 
Desire is a category rarely used in the studies of religions, especially in the Christian tradition. It, it has become, however, however, an increasingly important category of analysis to understand the various social actors who are present in the plural possibilities of Christian experience. The tense relationship between faith and sexual and gender dissidents in the history of Christianity has aroused forms of resistance through a pulsating production of queer theology. In Latin America, queer theology has intersected, at least since the 1990s, with post-colonial perspectives that move the production of knowledge to the margins of the hegemonic center. From this perspective, the margin which for a long time was considered a destination for LGBTQI plus people is now understood as a theologizing body territory that celebrates sexual and gender pluridiversity. Using Marcela Altausrit in decent theology, a queer sexual and post-colonial theological proposal, this, present, this presentation examines the transits that occur between the center and the margin of Christianity, which result in liberational faith experiences. The choice of Althausrid in this theology to guide this study is not naive. The Argentine theologian created a theological perspective that makes visible the sexual and gender dissidents who were for so long left out the theological debate, or rather excluded from the, that debate. Next slide, please. The marginal at the margin. As this presentation advances analysis of the religious phenomenon, focusing on the category of desire, it is important to locate this desire. I refer not only to a geographic location, but also a social location, and therefore a political and economic one that starts with the premise of existing colonizing center of power that organizes and hierarchizes human relationships. The margin appears in a dialectical relationship with the center and can be understood as a place of marginalization, that is, of expulsion from the center of power. In this presentation, desire is located on at least two sites, in Latin America and in sexual and gender dissidents. According to Fernanda Bruno, Bruno Cardoso, Marta Canachiro, Luciana Guignon and Lucas Melgaço, editors of the book, Techno Technopolíticas da Vigilância, Surveillance Technopolitics. Quote, uh, next slide, please. Thinking, thinking from Latin America implies thinking from the margin, understood less as a peripheral region than a liminal region, sometimes inside, sometimes outside the agencies that constitute the great vectors of surveillance culture in the so-called global north, sometimes in consonance, sometimes in disagreement with the critical agenda and the resistance patterns in force in the same north. End of quote. Latin America has a vibrant and theological production, which includes liberate, liberation theology and indecent theology. In indecency, it is possible to think of the margin also as a territory of sexual and gender dissident bodies. After all, the center's body is mostly white, heterosexual, and cisgender. The body on the margin is the object body, the body of the travestis, the body of indecency. It is necessary to emphasize, however, that the margin and the center are not understood here as territories separated by unsurmountable borders. On the contrary, the objective of thinking about the margin in this context is precisely to draw attention to bridges that were built to the cracks that were open, to the gaps that were produced on the wall of the disaffected. In this analysis, the margin offers itself as a place where desire is embodied in dispute for fair and more supportive relationships in relation to differences. After all, as Bruno Cardoso, Canachiro, Guignon, and Elgasso explain, to think from the margins or from the Latin American situation is immediately to maintain 
diversity, diversity of bodies, desires, and experience of Christianity. The desire that exists in the margin escapes the notion of homogenization of the other. Homi Baba explains that. Next slide, please. Quote, it is only by understanding the ambivalence and the antagonism of the desire of the other that we can avoid the increasingly facile adoption of the notion of a homogenized other for a celebratory oppositional politics of the margin or minorities, end of quote. This is one of the objectives of analysis on the margins and from the margins to propose ways of breaking separations by the celebration of differences. Even if one were to agree with the possibilities of encounters between margin and the center, it's essential to understand that separatist strategies of the centers, to understand the separatist strategies of the center, as Bell Hooks explained. Next slide, please. Quote, to be in the margin is to be part of the whole, but outside the main body. We focus our attention on the center as well on the margin. We understood both. This mode of seeing reminded us of existence of a whole universe, a main body made up for both margin and center. Our survival depends on our ongoing public awareness of the separation between margin and center and ongoing private acknowledgement that were a necessary vital part of the whole, end of quote. To understand sexual and gender dissidence on, in Christianity, more than thinking from the margin, it is necessary to think marginally. Such a thinking is not marginalized, but is from the minority, subaltern and diasporic perspective. The marginal avoids the assimilation from the margins to the center and asserts itself as a powerful territory of life experience. The important differentiation between the center, the margin, and the marginal can be better understood from the indecent theological proposal of Althausrid. The theologian has asserted that indecent theology is a marginal theology. Her intention was to denounce liberation theology and feminist theology, which, according to her, were theologies that visited the margins or were co-opted by the margins, as she explains when comparing indecent theology to feminist theology. Next slide, please. Quote, from feminist theology, to indecent theology, it is not a progressive development, rather is a transversal, queer one, in that we can see how a high sexual suspicion concerning epistemology sparks a process that both unsettles and discovers. In this discovery, new understandings continue to interrogate the praxis of the church as action and reflection from the margins of the margins where a true marginal God refuses to live and be co-opted by the center, end of quote. Althausrid's criticism of the liberation theology is concerned more with stabilities than discontinuities. According to the theologian, liberation theology did not break with the dogmatic and systematic approach of hegemonic Christianity even though it elevated the poor as a preference for God's liberating proposal. Also, according to Althaus Reed, liberation theology privileged a, a countryside theology disregarding the urban poor. It is from the urban poor who attends the South Sabars that Althaus Reed proposes an indecent theology that destabilizes the eternal truths of hegemonic theology. It's interesting to point out that in decent theology, despite presenting strong criticisms of liberation theology and feminist theology, asserts itself as part of the true, and here I quote, but more marginal and perhaps even more messy, end of quote. This is because in decent theology is not a progression from one to another, but a radicalization of the contextuality of the bodies it represents. 
In this case, it is, it is already possible to perceive a transit between the theological perspectives that points to the transit itself between the margin and the center. However, this transit between the margin and the center should not mean the extinction of the marginal power that inhabits the margins. An example is when the center opens up to divergent sex gender experience in a discourse of inclusion, which for Althausrit can be dangerous because when the center captures dissident sexual and gender identities, it can actually be defined as, here I quote, theological exercise by simple economy of inclusion, end of quote. This is an example of assimilation of the margin by the center. Next slide, please. Queer theology takes its place not in the, at the center of theological discourses conversing with power, but at the margins. It is a the theology from the margins which wants to remain at the margins to recognize sexual discrimination in the church and in the theological thinking by selective thematic of reflection or by the deauthorization of other discourses. Does not mean that theology from the margins should strive for equality. Terrible is the fate of theologies from the margin when they want to be accepted by the center. Queer theology strives instead for differentiation and plurality, end of quote. In this and theology is a queer theological perspective produced marginally in Latin America and from marginal bodies, marginal lives. Therefore, it is important, its importance lies in transgressing the domestications of the desire and the passion by hegemonic Christianity. Queer theology is then, in the words of Althausrid and Lisa Ishewood. Next slide, please. Queer theology is, quote, a sexual theology with a difference, a passion for the marginalized. The passion is compassion, but also a commitment to social justice because there is a wider, wider understanding of human relationships involved. A marginal theology considers human relationships affectionate or sexual, and does not aim to make a cultural translation of theological production to the margins, but to produce theology on the margins. One of the forms of this marginal the theological production is the telling of unsubmissive stories. Next slide, please. Telling marginal stories. Uh, in order to know the experience of unsubmission in relation to Christianity, it's necessary to have attentive ears. The experience of a sexual and gender dissidence located on the fringes of tradition exists in an unauthorized theological places and are silenced by the violence of the Christianity that claims to be absolute. David Jasper explains. Next slide, please. Quote, margins of many kinds are explored. People live on the margins of history and culture. They live on the margins between faith and doubt. They live on geographical margins or beyond them. Thus, marginalization may breed dissident, but it may also and more powerfully bring about a sense of exile and a sense of being an outsider who is not even a position to articulate a dis dissenting voice, end of quote. The dissent voice that occupy the margins have stories to tell, stories to realize. Althausrid asks about the sexual stories that are told according to her and Ishe would. Queer theology is, and here I quote them, a radical form of love talk of theology. That is a theology which produces a profound questioning into the ways of love in our life as individuals and as society and things and things love can do in our world. End of quote. And they add, uh, can you do next? Next slide, please. Using perspective from queer theology, we may say that to reflect theologically is always an activity, activity done 
with the presupposition of love. To talk theology is to talk about a loving style of relationship. Theological themes are themes of love, even if perhaps this has been obscured by centuries of using a terminology which may have lost their original transparency, end of quote. But is queer theology the only theology speaking of love? No, because all theology is a sexual act. That means that even though it does not claim to be sexual, hegemonic theology brings within itself a cisgender and heterosexual orthodoxy, which as a dogma is divinized. After all, as Althausrid explains, next slide. Theology is never innocuous or sexually innocent or neutral. The question that arises then is, if hegemonic Christianity theology also speaks of love, what unlove or what love stories does it not tell? The non-oralized sexual stories of hegemonic Christianity are those lived by sexual and gender dissidents who are on the margins, challenging with their bodies, their affections and their desires, the unstable claims of hegemonic Christian morality. For Althausrid, even if these stories are told, they are not heard, as she explains. Quote, Margina marginal marginality seems to be somehow the first condition of whether sexual stories are heard or not. At the top of Rubin's pyramid, we can hear sexual stories told loudly and clear, but somehow at the bottom of the stories are shouted. The difference is what is that they are ignored. End of quote. Althausrid refers here to the erotic pyramid pro pro proposed by Gail Rubin. In this pyramid, uh, next slide, please. Quote, marital and reproductive heterosexuals are at the top and below are the most despised sexual castes, which currently includes transsexual, transvestites, fetishists, sadomasochists, sex workers, such as prostitutes and pornographic models. And below all, those who eroticism transgress, transgresses general boundaries, end of quote. Faltaus read the voice there places down the pyramid are not heard and therefore do not take part in hegemonic interactions. She explains that once the story is heard, it, it becomes part of an interactive social world and negotiate its space of meaning and signification within a network of other unheard stories. And from that actions for transformation and challenge to status quo may take place. Orality presents itself as a fundamental instrument for disruptive practice because the stories told penetrate the social fabric, causing the transformations that are so necessary for liberating proposal of Christianity understood from the base of the pyramid. Althausrid presents a systematic theology from the margins of sexuality in her indecent theology. For her, Theology is based on stories, sexual stories. And the act of retelling or telling these stories is oral sex, based on recognizing private life as having important theological content, because all theology is sexual theology, as she explains. Next slide, please. We need to consider seriously the fact that it is oral sex we are dealing with, the retelling of sexual stories in the gathering of communities, which can build the project of liberation of the kingdom better than the heterosexual reproductive stories we are using. End of quote. Slide. Next slide, please. The unsubmissive transit between the center and the margin of Christianity. The margin presents itself as a new paradigm according to Silvia Regina de Lima. Next slide. She's a Brazilian theologian. 
and she says, reality demands paradigms with a holistic conce conception of life, of the created world, of interhuman relationships. It demands concepts that break down barriers, build bridges, encourage dialogue, reaffirm life, and respect the value of richness of diversity that makes up our continent. To find this new paradigm, it is necessary to change the place from where the world is seen, to have another point of view, another starting point. It is looking at the world from below, from the little ones. It is looking at the from the ground with your feet planted on the ground, with a, a body made of earth and fragile fragility and firmness, a supportive body, a body part of other bodies, end of quote. This is the importance of our Althausrid oral sex to tell stories from the margins, creating a new paradigm of theological reflection that does not disregard the significance of margins in liberating a project of Christianity. After all, the margin is a non-negotiable site of grace and freedom. From this paradigm, what can be seen is that the transit is part of this dissident insurgent experience. For Ihab Hassan, this journey can be understood as a metaphor and transgression, a textuality of motion, because, next slide, please. Quote, travel in any case transgresses. It oversteps time as well as space, culture, as well as consciousness, blurring boundaries, though it recreates them. It marginal, re, -marginal, re -marginalizes areas it has smeared, end of quote. The transgression of this trip may require multiple passports. Althausrid affirms that a queer theologian has many passports because she's a theologian in diaspora. That is a theologian who explores at the crossroads of Christianity, issues of self-identity and the identity of her community, which are related to sexu sexuality, race, culture, and poverty. The metaphor of passports helps to explain how this process of ruptures and continuities takes place by traveling between the center and the margins. However, this is not a compulsory journey. It is a journey of resistance that gives rise to a spirituality of resistance. In this sense, a spirituality of resistance is urgent, which does not mean accommodation, but rather persevering tenacity, capable of withstanding and facing systems of the domination. Transit from the margin to the center is not a movement from the margins into the central discourse of theology for which Althausrid criticized liberation theology, but is a transit of resistance, which questions the le legitimacy of the tradition based on the stories of the dissidents. Therefore, uh, next slide, please. It is an unsubmissive transit, which does not submit to castration by the hegemonic Christianity, defying orthodoxy from a pra praxis based on marginal lives. Althaus did explains that the praxis needs to be done through sexual deviance because only that perspective can challenge the regulatory regime of re heterosexuality sacralized by Christianity. In this process of autonomy, when talking about themselves, sexual and gender dissidents oralize their Christian experience from their own struggles, pains, contradictions, ambiguities. This is one of the main contributions of the margin as a paradigm, the possibility of knowing Christianity from incarnated experience of marginal desire. After all, next slide, please. As explains Grada Quilomba, and here I quote her, the margin is a location that nourishes our capacity to resist oppression, to transform, and to imagine alternative new worlds and new discourses, end of quote. Althausrid in decent theology does not, does that by moving 
objects and subjects of theology around, turning points of reference and repositioning bodies of knowledge and revelation in some, sometimes unsuitable ways, as she explains. Next slide, please. Queer theologies go into diasporas by using tactics of temporary occupation, disruptive practice which are not necessary to be repeated and reflections which aim to be disconcerting. At the bottom of the line of queer theologies, there are biographies of sexual migrants, testimonies of real lives in rebellions made of love, pleasure and suffering, end of quote. This embodied experience of indecent theology create exchange alleys to the quest that present a challenge. Next slide, please. The point considered now is how we can ever know theology from different centers, such as the center of a queer nation. This may not be called a theology from the margins anymore, but a theology from recognizable, legitimized, if not approved, and visible centers which have been rendered and in, rendered invisible. We need to reflect in the area of different sexual ways of knowing which could be considered foundational, even always provisory, as in the process of theological praxis, for a new way of reflecting on God and on us, end of quote. The power of the margin lies in breaking down borders by creating other centers, not centers that are exclusive or hegemonic, but centers that affirm diversity and that are based on relationships of solidarity. Next slide. Conclusion, marginal desire. The marginal epistemology proposed by a queer indecent theology is fundamental to the theories and methods for the study of Christianity and to the theme of alterity in a global Christian studies. The transit between the margin and the center shows that the study of religions cannot be produced only from a cultural translation, but also from a cultural experience which recognizes the belonging of dissident insurgent inclusive initiatives that challenge Christianity. Thus, Marginal desire presents itself as a category of recognition of the experience of sexual and gender dissidents in Latin America that aims to oralize their sexual stories. The sound of these voices creates waves of, re of re resistance that cause fissures in the borders that separate the center from the margin and the sacred manifests itself. After all, God is desire, marginal, in transit, and unsubmissive desire. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Anna. Uh, so many things to follow up on. I especially appreciated uh, the, the definition of the margins as a non-negotiable site of grace and freedom. Uh, what a wonderful way to think of the margins. Again, a non-negotiable site of grace and freedom. Uh, are there any questions from those who are gathered here for Reverend Dr. Anna? Any questions, you can uh, type your questions directly into the chat uh, or you can unmute and ask uh, your questions, clarifications, et cetera. And this, this um, um, quote of the, mar the margin is a non-negotiable site. It's, it's in the book, uh, The Queer God of Marcelo Tausini. While we're um, uh, waiting on any questions, again, you can place those in the chat or you can unmute and ask a question. Uh, some other uh, quotations that stood out for me among many, uh, a very uh, abundant uh, presentation here. A true marginal God refuses to leave 
and be co-opted by the center. Isn't that a, a great way to think? A true marginal God refuses to leave and be co-opted by the center. Queer theology is a theology from the margins that wants to remain at the margin. Uh, there's not that uh, desire to become like everyone center. else, and then we will be acceptable and accepted. Um, this, this is in an interview that Marcela gave to a Brazilian uh, journalist. And the, the journalist asked, what is the queer God? What is queer God? And she explains that the queer God uh, is not the God that visit the margins and say, oh, hey, I'm the God. And let me get you here from the margin, take you to my kingdom. And she says uh, that it was important to understand that we not only want to be out of the closet, but we want to take God out of the closet. And she says that she wants God to come out of the closet and says, oh, today I'm Marlene Dietrich. So, and play with God. Thank you so much. I wanted to just acknowledge that I appreciate everything I've heard and many of the quotes kind of stick in my head or are running around in there, but um, a new understanding of oral sex, my God. So many people need to hear that, that, you know, we want to, give voice to our experience, uh, verbalizing, becoming oral in, in, in a true uh, literal sense, I guess. Um, but thank you for all of those fabulous quotes. And I'm delighted that this is being recorded because I need to hear it again and again. Yeah, yeah it's a lot of quotes because uh, that's my way of giving voice to them. You know, like a lot of people in the United States, they know Marcella, but we read her from a different place. So, of course, it challenges us. Um, so by by reading the, the and ex, studying the idea of auto sex, that really um, helped me to, to write my book uh, where I tell my story and it's based on the Ten Commandments. So I, I do a, a queer reading of the Ten Commandments. And so, and I tell my story. So it's just, um, okay, Marcella told I should do this. Let me do it. And so. Um, Reverend Dr. Anna, I'm wondering if you could expand a little bit more on um, uh, the Marcella Office read quotation that theology is never innocuous. It's never sexually innocent or neutral. Could you expand on that a little bit uh, for us? What do you think uh, that means that theology is never innocuous? Yeah, Marcella is saying this, uh, said that in the book, Indecent Theology, and she's explaining um, what she says, it's um, all theology is a sexual theology. So when she says it's never knuckles about it, it is still sexual because when it's, it does not say, okay, I'm a, I'm a queer uh, sexual theology. It is already, uh, should be probably a white heterosexual cisgender one. So there is no way to say, oh, the, we are doing sexual theology and you guys are, you, I'm sorry for the guys. And you are not doing sexual um, theology because all theology is sexual. Because what Marcella is doing, Marcella is a, a Marxist, right? A materialist. So she's looking at the bodies and saying, there is it's only going to have liberation when we have economical liberation. And there is only and it's only going to, to have uh, economic liberation if we have sexual liberation because sexuality regulates the economy by hierarchizing, right? Uh, organizing it. So that's, that's what she's saying. The, the, the hegemonic uh, Christian tradition is work towards uh, keeping this establishment. Make sense? Hello. 
Well, it does make sense actually. Um, Dr. Anna, can you please um, enlighten me more because this is just my understanding of, of what you just said or about the, that it's never innocuous. Um, I think it's really liberating to, to hear that because it's just saying that it is, there's always consequences of what you know, like a preacher or a pastor would say. And in many churches here in my in my place, they I don't think they're aware of that. Um and I felt that it really had an impact on on me um with you know how they preach it. So if if our pastors are sensitive enough to know that that their teachings, interpretations can have a real world um, implications in, you know, especially regarding with sexuality, because it, it really has the potential to influence, you know, our attitude, the members, I mean, those people who can hear that, their attitudes, their behaviors, and also social norms regarding sexuality. Am I, am I correct? Yeah, it, it, like in the studies of religion, we used to say that um, religion is language, right? Not discourse only, but the rituals, the liturgy, everything is language. So sometimes we think that this does not have um, a concrete impact in our lives, but they have. <laughs> For sure they do. Uh, for example, I'm gonna give you a, a an example from Brazil, okay? There is this big mega church, which is in my city, Belo Horizonte. And this um, one of the pastors, he moved to Orlando, Florida. And now he lead, has a big ministry there. He, he just bought a $4 million building in Orlando. And anyway, so he's really attached to Bolsonaro, do, to the extreme uh, uh, right wing, things like this. And during the, the Pride Month, he came out several times uh, saying how God hates pride. And his uh, last uh, um, service, he said, God, looking at the LGBT people, he says, I'm disgusted. I want to kill them. But God does not want, uh, cannot kill them. So what should we do? So he was invited, inviting people to kill LGBT people. And Brazil is the place where the most LGBT people is killed, are killed. And the, the highest number of transgender people killed is in Brazil. And the second one is uh, Mexico, which is half of it. Every 29 hours, a, Bra a Brazilian is killed because uh, LGBT phobia. So this kind of discourse that is not only here, it's in Philippines, it's United States, we know this, but uh, the discourse, the language, they have social and material effects. So what they're doing with theology, it's not neutral, it's not innocuous, it's a plan and it's a project of power that is taking uh, uh, theology to um, Nancy, to make sense, I don't know, I don't have the word to sustain, maintain it, yeah. Uh, thank you, Jeffy, for that question. Uh, and again, if you have any questions, you can list them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask. I'm wondering, um, Reverend Dr. Anna, if you could say a little bit about how the diaspora is not necessarily a bad thing and exile is not necessarily a, a bad thing. Um, I, in, in some of my experience, uh, that's very much uh, resisted, that's seen as a bad place. Why would we ever want to be in the diaspora? Why would we ever want to 
uh, be in exile. And if we are forced to be in the diaspora, if we are forced to be in exile, we're going to try everything we can uh, to uh, get back to center. Uh, so could you just expand a little bit on uh, the beauty of the diaspora, the, uh, the grace uh, in exile? Sure. Um, I'm not going to try to to tell. Um, um, do no Gloria Zaldua, the Chicana theoretical from Texas. So Gloria Zaldua, uh, I'm going to have problem with the uh, vocabulary. So if someone can help me by understand what I want to say, she says in our relationship with the center, there are four ways of relating to it. We can be a bridge, right? Usually we do this. Um, we can be that bridge that do like this. Draw so bridge. I, yeah. So we can, so sometimes we don't want to be that bridge. We need a little bit of time. So we just do this. We can be a uh, island, totally go away and do not want to, to, go to the center, we are tired. They have been really uh, being um, um, violent with us. So we, we go to the island. And also she says, I don't know if this makes sense in English, a uh, uh, um, bench of sand, sand bench, no, sand bench. You know, when in the, uh, Reverend Caroline said, oh, what? so when there's the ocean, Sometimes, depending of the time of the day, if sand dune, maybe it's this, with the water goes down and you can go further walking in the sand. And then if the water goes up, you, you need to. Where the to tide ebbs and flows. Yeah, there's a lot of words here. So you, you understood, right? So, and she says uh, that she is the <laughs> sandbar because depending of how things are going, she will adapt to it. Uh, so this is one way of understanding the diaspora, the exile, because some people really will go into the island and be isolated. And this is not a sad place. This is a place also of celebration because I've, I've heard with my advisor, my, my doctoral advisor, that in the margins, we need to the marginalized. So at the margins, I had, for example, the pleasure of meeting uh, the black movement in Brazil, which has changed completely my way of doing theology, how much I have learned from the, the black woman in Brazil. So only because I went, I, I recognize myself in the margins. So this diaspora, it's, it's a movement. And queer theology, uh, as Marcel Altausrid and Lisa Isha would explain, it's a movement of people denouncing the cis hetero patriarchal uh, systems of the hegemonic theology. So we are there at the margins, but we are in movement always. So that's why I like this idea of the bridge and the sandbar of Marcel uh, Glorens Aldua to explain it. And you can see there in the chat a clarifying question from uh, Karma Amos. And these four ways are value neutral. They're neither bad or good, but could be appropriate in given contexts or at given times. Is this correct? Yeah. In these four ways of value neutral. Yeah, because she says it depends on you, right? Sometimes you can't do anymore. For example, she she gave she's she's writing this in an essay and she explains for example people would always go to her to say oh do you have um um uh, black people to suggest to speak and she, so she was always someone who people would go for references and i totally identify with that it's always people coming to say do you have a name? Do you have a suggestion? That means people are not looking around because we are there. And so we always become someone who we're going to give names. And she, 
she is dealing with uh, racism and she is, is uh, trying to understand her relationship with what she called white woman. And white woman, she writes together. It's not white woman, it's white woman because it's something different from uh, for her than white woman. Is this uh, the branquitude? I don't know how to say this in English. Yeah. <laughs> That's very helpful in thinking about diaspora and exile. Thank you. Uh, we have a comment here. It looks like every liberation movement is somehow intertwined in the process of liberation. There's no liberation process if someone is left behind in the process. Are we leaving anyone behind? Felipe Fialho, are you from Brazil? Yep, okay, thank you for coming. Maybe you can help me with my Portuguese, my English. <laughs> I just want to make one other comment. Um, wow, um, when I was in seminary eons ago, uh, black theology and liberation theology were bubbling up. We hadn't even thought about the term, the margins yet, um, but all of that kind of comes together now. In spite of the long line of um, people of African descent in the United States who have been attempted to be the bridge from the center to the margins and vice versa, the book this bridge called my back is something that feminist women have looked at and and um sometimes we decided we don't want to be that bridge uh, I, very helpful analogy um i hadn't thought about the island but as i think about what you just said about those four ways um the island is sometimes necessary for healing and reprieve to be able to try to be a bridge again or to try something different, but the island is definitely a time away and a part that can be very healing. Uh, I know some people of African descent in this country, uh, especially I think about in the state of Oklahoma, where such an atrocity happened that they're not trying to hide and cover up as not a race riot, but something else when black communities, not, not individuals, but whole community bombed from the sky and people cart off like cattle and put somewhere, um, that can never be undone. And it's crazy that anybody could live now and think that there's not residue. <laughs> Lots of residue from that uh, poverty that came from that, uh, family wealth that was stolen and taken away. Just And some folk um, would just like to be left alone. Black people have our own cities and towns and restaurants and businesses and uh, treat each other better than we have been taught to treat each other in this country because we are <laughs> and always are on the outside. It's a mess and it just grieves me. But thank you for helping us have other ways to look at it. Yeah, uh, Reverend Karma is saying here that Gloria Zaldua wrote this, The Bridge Called My Back. So it's the same author. Yeah. And I was go going to say that I mean, in a way, we could look at the island as this sabbatical healing place, but we know that definitely is definitely not, because we are always trying to survive, right? In Brazil, we're dealing with poverty, we're de dealing with racism, we're dealing with violence, so to be alive, such a miracle. Uh, but yes, uh, I, I am someone who to produce theology, I need to be on the island. I mean, I go, I, I, right, but then I have my material and then I need the island. And that's where I produce theology, which is maybe the hardest place to be. Uh, folks, we have time for uh, one more question. I'm scanning, I'm scanning. Uh, yep, there we go, Scotty. 
Reverend yeah, Scotty? Just real quick. Um, I don't, this is very, well, it's hard to articulate what all is happening inside my head. And I think that's probably true for a lot of us. I'm even, I mean, I was even thinking of a couple of things. I was remembering Jenny Boy Bull's uh, dissertation that she did back in the 70s, Sexuality in the Eucharist. I thought of John Fortunato's book, Embracing the Exile from the 1980s. You know, I just thought all of these, uh, this is, story has been trying to be told for a very long time. Uh, this, however, is kind of volcanic. And uh, so uh, for a small town church like ours, the great struggle that I find is is exactly between we want to be in the center, we want to be accepted, we don't, you know, conflict avoidance, all that stuff, and this fact that God doesn't go with us when that happens. And uh, so I, what I'd like to do is sort of say that in context of small towns, like in Texas, uh, where you have uh, so much oppression and where our story is very difficult to be told, whether we are literally, MCC is literally the only open and affirming voice for hundreds of miles that uh, I need to know more about this. And so I know it's not a question, but I just want to end at least, or just put it out there at least to say that this is really, really important because this is very real in happening uh, in a town like this. And I suspect this is happening in little small towns you know, all over. Uh, MCC absolutely must exist if for no other reason than to say these things over and over again to a people who really uh, don't know what to do. Yeah. So my idea with my my presentation was to to help us to think that okay, we we are talking about the margins, and but how do we relate with the center? But can we really talk about margin and center are really in one side or the other? Or, or what about this transit that we need to do? I remember talking to one MC reverend once and she's, she said to me, uh, she's from the US. So, because in Brazil, the story is totally different. But she said, well, we had this rupture in the first day um, creating MCC, but the second day was like, okay, we want to be a chapter in the history of Christianity. And that's what we say. We want to, in our uh, statement of faith, we are a chapter in the history of Christianity. So does that mean we want to be included in the center? We want to be part of the center or not? So this would be, we could talk a lot about this. And so it depends a lot. And and yes, uh, there are a lot of productions about this kind of topic. In Brazil, let me tell you this, I'm the only uh, clergy, a lesbian clergy in Brazil. Like in the whole country? Uh -huh. Wow. Wow. So we have um, a cisgender, I'm the only cisgender uh, lesbian clergy and uh now we have some um pastors coming from pentecostal churches that does really does does not do queer theology do something different so we are talking about i'm talking about a really different uh context and so here i need to build the bridges as someone <laughs> as well, we yeah, you attend, and I'm not attending MCC here, and I attend a Baptist church because it's time to build bridges. And as Brazil is trying to rebuild uh, its democracy after four years of Bolsonaro and coming from a dictatorship, 30 years of dictatorship. So uh, in this process of thinking about them, our democracy, it is important for us to build bridges. And that's why I am part of this big movement, what we call Evangelicus Progressistas, uh, Progressive Evangelicals in Brazil. Thank you. This has truly been a feast. And I am so grateful for this time together. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Anna, uh, for sharing your time and your gifts with us 
And uh, we are going to uh, have a closing prayer from Elder Velma Garcia. Um, we do have, uh, but before uh, Velma prays, just a FYI to uh, everyone, uh, we ha uh, Anna has put her uh, Instagram handle uh, in the chat, uh, so you can uh, you can contact and connect uh, there. So we'll turn things over to Elder Velma. Thank you. Oh God, all I can say is wow, wow, wow. Thank you, thank you for the mind blown with this uh, theology from the margins. Thank you for the gift of Anna being presenting to us today and helping us to, to grow in our, in our thinking. Uh, help us to really grasp at what speaks to our heart and uh, create those uh, new centers. What a concept, create a new center. Even while God dwells even while we think that God doesn't come with us into the margins, that's because God is already there waiting for us. Lord, help us speak to us. Help us to take action. Bless this event. Uh, bless Reverend Dr. Anna. Bless Gaudi for organizing all. And bless all the other presenters that are yet to come. And all these beautiful saints, whether MCC or not, we are all your children and we belong to you and we do work for you. And we ask your blessings as we go from this place in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. I'm really blessed. Thank you. Thank you. Emma.